So things are getting from bad to worse and the situation in Ukraine is getting critical with the G7 bending together to strike back. So quite a few things have happened over the past few days and chief of which is the possible capture of Bakhmut by the Russians, right? There's a lot of conflicting information coming out of the city but it looks like it's going to fall sooner or later. So the situation on the ground doesn't seem to be panning out well for the West and this battle is actually quite important because both sides, they're throwing tons of resources and weapons at each other and whether Russia wins or loses, it's gonna lead to another escalation by either side. And what's freaking out the West is a win by the Russians, and there are a ton of reports that the city has fallen. Now Russia has claimed victory, and Putin is congratulating the troops, Ukraine is denying it, but God knows who or what to believe today. And that's why the entire agenda of the G7 summit is centered around striking back against Putin. It's not about the debt ceiling or the banking crisis, but how to tackle Russia and China. And what's interesting this time is how they are trying to get support from the global south. And this is a pivot for sure, but this is truly bizarre because the G7 is trying to rope in countries like Indonesia, India and Brazil. And this is nothing new. The G7 summit has always invited guest countries before. But the composition of the extra attendees is very curious, it's very telling. They are developing countries that include the BRICS nations because frankly, the G7 has no choice. The G7 share of global GDP has dropped from 67% down to 44% over the past 50 years. And this is a very important point because it shows their influence is slipping. And as long as the rest of the world supports Russia and China, all their sanctions won't really work. Now the G7 isn't really a group of the biggest economies because if it is, then China and India would be somewhere in that list, right? But they aren't. And I think a lot of us know by now that the G7 is another term for the collective West and friends. A lot of interesting things have happened during the G7 summit that we need to talk about today. And the most obvious is that more sanctions are going to hit Russia, plus there's a special guest appearance by Zelensky. And that is so bizarre that it will save the best for last. Now just recently, The Spectator published a stunning admission that the economic war against Russia has failed. And this is British media that has come to the realization that maybe the sanctions aren't really working. But I want us to focus on one shocking statement that I never thought they would dare to say. And listen to this the West embarked on its sanctions war with an exaggerated sense of its own influence around the world, which is exactly what's happening. I'm going to show one chart that just smashes the idea that the G7 sanctions are all powerful. Now, this chart shows the average crude shipments that are coming out of Russia. And before the war, all the way to the left, we can see the majority of Russian oil flowed to Europe. No surprise there. Those are the buyers in grey and blue bars. And yes, over time, Europe cut itself away from Russian oil. They went from over a million barrels a day to almost nothing. But guess who picked up the slack? Asia increased their imports of Russian oil. It's obvious who bought up the excess supply the Europeans left behind. It was China and India. In fact, the volume of Russian oil exports is back above pre-war levels. And if we look carefully at just the overall volumes, you can't even tell that the sanctions were imposed on Russian oil. It is still around 3 million barrels a day. It is as if nothing has changed. And that's why the G7, they are doubling down their sanctions. They need to push the envelope and rope in the global south on their side. China won't budge, but if they can get India to stop buying Russian oil, it could collapse Russian revenues. At least that's the idea, right? Now, India's Russian imports have grown tremendously from almost nothing to over 2 million barrels of crude oil. They are refining it and reselling it to Europe, making a tidy profit. And this is one reason why India was invited to the G7 summit and why the West is pressurizing India to stop buying Russian oil. Now, Prime Minister Modi met with Zelensky during the G7 summit, promising Ukraine, India will do whatever they can for the resolution of the war. And I believe that might come in the form of aid and financial assistance, but India will probably continue buying Russian oil for their economy for the foreseeable future. And let's not forget a global recession is coming and every country is out for themselves. Now the sanctions might have cut down Russian revenues, but it has created an inflation hell for the rest of the world. And this is slowing down the global economy, but guess what? More sanctions are gonna come. And during the G7 summit, the coalition is promising more sanctions on Russia for good measure. And as we have said before, this isn't going to stop until both sides reach a negotiated settlement, right? You have to come to the table and iron out an agreement, a negotiated settlement that both sides aren't really happy with. But it's not going to happen anytime soon. The sanctions will keep piling on until it becomes one big monstrous mountain. And the UK is moving to ban Russian diamonds 
while the US is targeting Russian gold miners, right? And this isn't a surprise because Russia is one big commodity giant going just beyond oil and gas. Let's talk more about the diamond ban. It sounds kind of like a big deal, but it actually isn't that impactful. And let's put this into perspective. The Russian diamond trade is only around $4 billion annually at best. And compare this to nearly $500 billion of total exports in 2021, it's only less than 1%. So a British diamond ban isn't going to crush Russian revenues just yet. Even if the ban happens, guys, the majority of Russia's diamonds aren't flowing to the UK. It's flowing to Belgium, the UAE, India, and Israel. But if the West decides to completely cut away Russian diamonds, the flow could simply get redirected to other markets that include China, and most importantly, more will flow into India. And there is speculation that Russian diamonds are passing through India. Over 90% of the world's diamonds are cut and polished in India, especially in the city of Surat. Now, if a crackdown on Russian diamonds was to happen, the G7, they only need India's cooperation to trace and ban imports. But that could hurt the Indian diamond industry and the economy as a whole. But another move by the UK is to restrict Russian imports of copper, aluminium and nickel. Now, this is important because the LME is still accepting Russian metals into their warehouses. The LME is basically a metals exchange. Countries, traders and companies can freely buy and sell their production in one convenient place. And that's the reason why the LME isn't banning Russian metals yet. It's because it will wreak havoc on the global markets. It will cause another commodity squeeze, especially in the West. I take Rusal for example. This aluminium producer from Russia alone supplies the world 6% of their needs. So trying to restrict Russian metals from the LME it's just going to force the flow towards other financial centers like Shanghai. So there are limits to how much you can squeeze Russian commodities because there are always outlets out there. And the same goes for American sanctions on Russian gold miners. Yes, it will affect the flow of Russian gold, but it won't stop it. It will just flow through China and other markets and possibly end up in India as well. Now, China and Russia are essentially one unified economic unit. And that's why a huge part of the summit was about how to contain China. And I think we can see how focused the G7 summit really is against China and Russia. It's all about how to punish Russia and de-risking from China. And the G7 wants China to play by the rules and to stop economic coercion. So right off the bat, you already have China branded as the enemy. And this is not a good sign and you can bet that Chinese aren't very happy about this. If we read the G7 communique, we can see what the West wants from China. A growing China that plays by international rules will be of global interest. We are not decoupling or turning inwards at the same time. We recognize that economic resilience requires the risking and diversifying. And I think we can see where this is going. There will be more sanctions coming for China and the G7 is going to reduce their trade dependence. They are going to rely on French shoring their production in places like South Korea or even Vietnam. Now, this won't happen overnight. It will take years, it will take decades. But one thing is clear, deglobalization is happening and there's no stopping this trade. And that is why while Biden and France were in Hiroshima, China just hosted a historic Central Asia summit to challenge Western dominance. Basically, China is on a tour to consolidate allies and build new relations away from the West. It's all about their own de-risking from the West as well. Now, if we look at China's Belt Road Initiative or the BRI, it flows through Central Asia and they are moving to secure it. We can see how the region is essentially the connection point between Europe and the Middle East. That's why China is pouring billions into the BRI there. That's why the summit is happening. President Xi is pushing so hard because it's likely that Europe will be breaking away from the BRI. And if that happens, China will lose a big trading route. Now, Italy is already on the brink of breaking away from the agreement and it's likely the rest of Europe might do the same. So China is going to close ranks with the rest of Asia and the Middle East as well. Now, this is important for us because globalization is breaking down in real time. In the years ahead, we're going to see a deeper split between the West and their allies with the rest of the world, right? And I think this is an irreversible change. This means a world of higher inflation and interest rates where everything just gets more expensive. But let's talk about Zelensky now because he's the big star of the G7. He's the man of the hour. And I think we know why Zelensky went, right? He's asking for more aid from the G7. He needs more money to keep fighting the Russians. What's more interesting is Zelensky's move to get India and Brazil to Ukraine's side. He's essentially trying to pressure them to choose his side and not sit on the fence. And on paper, this seems like a brilliant move, doesn't it? But just a few days ago, Zelensky was in Saudi Arabia. 
and he accused certain Arab leaders of turning a blind eye. He told the Arabs that I'm here so that everyone can take an honest look. No matter how hard the Russians try to influence, there must still be independence. Basically, he's trying to shame them into withdrawing relations with Russia. Now, is this going to work? I don't really think so. Whether it's Saudi Arabia or India, I think they're still going to trade and work with the Russians. But what Zelensky is great at doing is getting more money from the West. He has already secured another round of fresh military aid from the United States. Biden just announced almost $380 million in ammunition, artillery and more. So we can expect Zelensky to continue his world tour, especially to the G7 nations, to get aid and money because honestly, it is working, right? And this war is not going to end because both sides will not back down. But what's really concerning is the escalation points, guys. We are slowly moving up the scale towards the fringes of conventional warfare. First, it was tanks, and now Zelensky is going to get his fighter jets, and it could be tactical nukes next. Now, previously, we made a video about how if Bakhmut falls, fighter jets might come. And it's really scary to see that coming true. Now, we don't know for sure if Bakhmut has really fallen yet. The fog of war is just so thick, both sides could be lying. But make no mistake, the West is about to supply Ukraine with their planes. Now, Biden has given his approval for the Allies to transfer their existing stocks of F-16s to Ukraine. And previously, the United States didn't really agree on that. But now, things have changed. So it's either the Battle of Bakhmut isn't going very well for the West, or Zelensky's presence in Hiroshima made all the difference. So this is how it could work. European countries like the UK and the Netherlands can now transfer their jets to Ukraine and then buy more from the United States. And on paper, the US won't be supplying jets directly, but honestly, the end result is still the same thing, right? And this is very scary because it is an escalation point. We don't know what could come from this new wall card in the battle. Russia's already sending warnings they might escalate back. It's basically brinksmanship on both sides. I really don't want to be alarmist, but all roads aren't leading to peace. This could easily escalate into something nuclear. And even if it doesn't, we are facing an inflation hell where Ukraine is essentially a black hole. Whether it's Russia or the West, everyone, the whole world will be pouring money in there to keep the conflict going. And here's how bad things are going. We have a world that's moving towards deglobalization. War spending is not going to end. And now Ukraine might really get their fighter jets. So just expect more chaos or inflation. Even as we move towards a recession, I think we're going to enter a stagflation and red lines will eventually be crossed and there could be responses from the Russian side as well. And we're at the beginning of a great power struggle and this chaos is just going to continue. So it's time to repair because we are truly running out of time. But let me know what you think in the comments below. How bad will this conflict escalate? Will Ukraine really get their fighter jets? Let me know in the comments below. Stay safe, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe as we navigate through these crazy times.